For this lesson, we're going to be continuing with the topic of inverses, and specifically inverses of functions. I did cover this in a previous lesson where I went over the basics of the idea of inverses, so if you need to, you should start there. Uh, otherwise, follow along here. You're probably going to get enough of a, re of a review to be able to pick up a lot of what you need. So for this lesson, we are specifically going to be taking a look at the inverses of quadratic and radical functions. And so quadratics are something that we focus on a great deal in the grade 10 course. And then we introduce the idea of radicals and what their graphs look like in the grade 11 course. And we go on to manipulate these. When we talk about inverses, an inverse is obtained from a relation by swapping or interchanging the domain and range of the relation. In terms of points, so if you're talking about a graph, you would take the x and y coordinates. Algebraically, so if you have an equation, you would swap the x and y and solve for y. In my previous lesson, I went to great pains to add a caveat to this number two, which is when we swap the actual letters x and y, we only do that when the independent and dependent variable letters or variable names have no meaning, which is the case here. But if the letters have a meaning, you don't want to swap the letters. If the letters have a meaning, then you just want to rearrange your equation. And again, I would refer you to that other lesson for more detail on that. So here, I've been asked to find the inverse of this parabola, this quadratic equation, algebraically. Since it involves x and y, those are generic, so I'm going to go ahead and start with that first step, which is I'm going to swap the x and the y. This turns into x equals y plus 5 all squared minus 2. Now I'm going to start to rearrange. I'll take the negative 2 over to the other side. It becomes x plus 2 equals y plus 5 all squared. I want to isolate y, so I need to free it from that squared. And the way that you undo a squaring is by taking the square root. Now, when we take the square root, there's something else that we need to be careful of, and I'm sure that many of you watching can already anticipate this, which is that you must consider both a positive and negative solution. And that comes from the idea that if I have x squared equal to 9, and I ask myself, what are the values of x that could possibly be squared and produce 9? The answers to that is I could take negative 3 and square it to get 9, or I could take positive 3 and square it to get 9. And so if I solve this, I actually end up with x equals plus or minus the square root of 9, which is how we end up with x equals plus or minus 3. So whenever you're taking the square root in a process in an equation, you need to consider both the positive and negative implications of that square root. I'm going to write my y over here on the left now, and I'm going to take this positive 5 over with my radical, and it's going to turn into a negative 5. Now the convention for when we write that is we normally actually write the whole number first, and then anything after the plus or minus, and so we end up with negative 5 plus or minus the square root of x plus 2. It doesn't really matter. This is just a communication convention. And as you can see here, negative 5 plus or minus the square root of x plus 2 has two possible solutions. y equals negative 5 plus the square root of x plus 2 and y equals negative 5 minus the square root of x plus 2. And so from our conditions that we talked about before, any single input here of x could produce two possible outputs for y, for the inverse. And although our question just asks us to find the inverse, I'm just pointing out to you, reinforcing the idea, that this particular inverse is not a function. I'm going to take the exact same parabola and I'm going to find the inverse of it graphically. Now I'm going to do a nice graph with a proper grid. So the first thing I notice is the location of the vertex 
on this parabola. The vertex is located at negative 5, negative 2. So I'm going to just use a 1 to 1 scale for this grid. So 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 5, negative 2. So there's the location of the vertex. I can tell from the leading coefficient of positive 1 that this parabola opens up. And I think to graph this quickly and easily, I'm going to make use of the step pattern. Because the a value is 1, the step pattern is going to just be positive 1, positive 3, positive 5, and so on. So what I do, because my grid is a 1 to 1 ratio, I take a step to the right and a step up by 1. Then I take a step to the right and a step up by 3. And then a step to the right and a step up by 5. Due to the symmetry of a parabola, I can do the same thing going to the left. So left 1, up 1, then left 1, up 3, and left 1, up 5. And notice I didn't really have to count those out because I know they must end up at the same height as the, um, the other point, the corresponding symmetrical point. Here's the real challenge. I know I gripe about this all the time, using this, this stylus and tablet to try to draw I'm looking at the screen, but I'm drawing down on my desk. That was actually one of the best I think I've ever done. So I'm sure to make a mess of this side, and it's already started. Yes. I will always give myself one attempt to try to make it better, and then I will just live with whatever horror I have introduced. Not terrible, but you notice that I missed those lines pretty terribly. Now, drawing a parabola, as much as that's a challenge to my artistic skills, that's not the point of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to find the graphical representation of the inverse. I'm going to start with the vertex again, and I'm going to take those coordinates, negative 5, negative 2, and I'm going to swap them. So now I go to negative 2, negative 5. And then I take, well, let's see, what are the coordinates of this point? That's at negative 4, negative 1. So now I go to negative 1, negative 4. Even drawing a dot is a challenge at times. And this other point is at negative 6, negative 1. So I go to negative 1, negative 6. I've got a point here at negative 3, positive 2. So I go to positive 2, negative 3. And there's that same kind of symmetry as here. Notice that the axis of symmetry on my original parabola was this line, x equals negative 5, and on my inverse, I'm actually going to be developing an axis of, or not, yeah, it's like an axis of symmetry, it's just horizontal, but this line of symmetry is at y equals 5. So this is the line y equals, sorry, negative 5, and so I can build, and you can see, this point that I put on must have a symmetric point here, and then we've got a point at negative 2, positive, what is it, 4, positive 7. So instead, I'm going to go to positive 7 and negative 2. And there should be a symmetric point, 1, 2, 3, and I can just go to the other side of that using symmetry. And once again, I will tax my skills with this setup. Oh, look at that, right through the points. And the last thing I'd like to point out here is that the original parabola opened up. It opened in the positive y direction. And the inverse opens to the right, which is the positive x direction. Notice it's both positive. The x and y have changed, but the overall trend is the same. And if my drawing is a little too crude, to see that nice symmetry across the line equals y equals x. Here you can see a computer generated version and there is the, the dot, the dashed line is y equals x and you can see that reflection very clearly. Now those were, that was a parabola. What if I start with a radical in this case? So in this case you can see I've got f of x equals and it's pre-graphed square root of x minus 2 minus 3. We've, ex we've looked at changing the x and y coordinates between inverses, but I want to point out that the definition for an inverse is that the domain and range are swapped. Basically, all things x become all things y, and all things that were y become all things that are x.
recognizing this domain and range being swapped is particularly important when you might be missing parts of the relation. In this blue graph, for example, we can see what parts of the relation are there and what parts might be missing. We could write the domain and range for that. And this, what I'm talking about here is going to be illustrated as I work through these different steps. Now, the first step is going to be no problem. The first step says to determine the inverse graphically. I'm going to start off at this point, which is at 2, negative 3, and I will draw the inverse at negative 3, positive 2. Also, I just want to point out that this, this uh, original kind of grows in the positive x and the positive y direction, so I'm going to expect my inverse to do the same thing. But we're going to do this honestly. We're going to pick out points. I've got another good point right here, which is at 3, negative 2. And so my corresponding point is going to be at negative 2, positive 3. And let's see, where else can I find a point? There's a point here at 6, negative 1. So negative 1, positive 6. And do I have another point? I do have another point here at 11, 0. So 0, 11. And so I'm going to start here, and I'm going to try not to make that big a mess. Let's try again. Not bad. Not bad at all. And you can see from the graph that this red curve looks very much like a parabolic shape, but it only has the right-hand side. And that's very clear from the graph itself. Now let's move on, and I'm, kind of, I'm sure the tone of voice is, is kind of giving you a hint here. Determine the equation of the inverse. So we're going to do that algebraically. The first thing we do is we start with the original, but we don't normally want to leave it in function notation. So I'm going to switch it over to what's known as xy notation. So I'm going to change that to y equals the square root of x minus 2 minus 3. When you write this, you can see I put that little extra hook on my radicals. Uh, that's so that I make it very clear things that are inside the radical versus outside. I'm using x and y here. They are generic, independent, and dependent variables. So I can swap x and y, no trouble. And this becomes x equals the square root of y minus 2 minus 3. Start to do my rearranging. So that becomes x minus 3 equals the square root of y minus 2. The opposite or inverse operation to square rooting is squaring. So what I'm actually going to end up doing here is I'm going to square both sides of my equation. Whatever I do to one side of the equation, I can do to the other. And I end up with x plus 3 all squared equals y minus 2. And my final piece of cleanup is y equals, I'm going to take this negative 2 to the other side, it becomes positive 2. y equals x plus 3 all squared plus 2. And if we think about that, well, this is the equation of a parabola, and that, that parabola has a vertex at negative 3, positive 2. And sure enough, that's where the vertex of our parabolic shape is. But you should also have noticed something else, and it's something we kind of have to put as a warning, which is this is the equation of the full parabola. This is the equation of the full parabola, but our graph is only half of a parabola. That's all we're entitled to. So there is a problem doing this just as an equation. What we need to do, and I believe I'll have uh, put this in the question, here I say restrict the domain of the inverse to match the graph. So we're not allowed to use the entire parabola. What we actually are only allowed to use is we can start with y equals x plus 3 all squared plus 2, but the domain of the inverse, now I guess before I write this, we should ask ourselves the question, it makes it easier for notation, is this inverse also a function? And we can certainly see from the graph vertical line test that it is. So I'm going to actually use inverse function notation, 
And I'm going to rewrite this as x plus 3 all squared plus 2. But I'm going to restrict the domain of the inverse to only be the stuff that we're entitled to, which is x member of r such that, and I'm allowed to have x values that are greater than or equal to negative 3. So this is known as restricting the domain. In this case, I restricted the domain of the inverse. Sometimes you restrict the domain of the original function. Sometimes you restrict the domain of the inverse. And in this case, I had to restrict it because I wasn't allowed to have the left part of the parabola. There are other times where you might restrict the domain because you're forcing one part to go away because it's not useful to you. And another way that I could have illustrated this, just one last thing I want to comment on here before I move on. If we go back and look at the original function, so what is the domain of the original function f? The domain of the original function f is x member of r such that, in this case, x is greater than or equal to 2. And what is the range of the original function? That is y member of r, such that y is greater than or equal to negative 3. And then, because of the definition of domain and range swap when you take the inverse, we could also, if we had done this correctly, we could have immediately known that the domain of f inverse is going to look exactly the same as the range of the original, except for now we write it with x's, x greater than or equal to negative 3, which is what I wrote right there. And then the range of the inverse is going to be y member of r such that y is greater than or equal to 2. And I didn't even need to look at the graph for that because I already wrote the domain of the original function. So that's also something that you can keep in mind. Here is the computer generated version. As you can see, I've dotted in the resulting parabola, but we are obviously not entitled to that entire parabola. So I basically have to take it away. And the way that I do that is through this restriction on the domain. I basically say I'm only keeping the right half of the parabola because my original function only included the top half, if you want to think of it that way, this sideways looking parabola, we only kept the top half of that. Okay, so I mentioned that sometimes we needed to have a restricted domain in order to match the situation. There are other times where we'll use the idea of a restriction to force what we want to have happen. So let's start again. Algebraically, here is my original function. This one is a parabola. So to find the inverse of that, I'm going to rewrite this in xy notation. I'm going to swap the x and the y because they are generic independent and dependent variables. So I end up with x equals 3y squared minus 6. x plus 6 equals 3y squared. y squared equals x plus 6 all divided by 3. And y itself is equal to plus or minus the square root of x plus 6 divided by 3. And so there is the equation of our inverse. But this, because it's got that plus or minus there, this inverse is not a function. Because of that plus or minus. The plus or minus tells us that this inverse is not a function. Now, in order to make this a function, what do we need to do? We need to either have only this plus or only this minus. So I'm going to actually sketch out both options. So option number one is I'm going to keep y equals, and I'm going to keep, and I'm just going to write it explicitly, the positive square root 
of x plus 6 over 3. Now, in order to do that, in order to be able to say this in a, a useful way, it probably helps if you at least think about the sketch of f of x. So how about we, what, is, what does a sketch of f of x look like? So I'm not going to try my hand at a straight line here. I'm just going to throw down a quick set of axes. What is the vertex of this particular parabola? It has a vertex at 0, negative 6. So we have a vertex at 0, negative 6. And this parabola opens up. And so we end up with a very rough curve that looks like that. Now, think about, in the case of the, of the uh, inverse, well, actually, you know what, since we've gone this far, let's go ahead and sketch that. Means, that means we're going to have our inverse to the vertex is going to be a point at 6, 0. And, sorry, no, I've got that wrong. My apologies. It was at 0, negative 6, so it's going to be at negative 6, 0. So it's going to be over here somewhere. And our original parabola opened in the positive y direction. So our inverse has to open in the positive x direction. So we can come up with a sketch pretty, pretty quickly and pretty easily. If I keep the positive part of this inverse, which part of the original am I keeping? So if I throw away this bottom part, that means that's the stuff that goes with the negative y values, and I'm keeping the stuff that goes with the positive y values. So when we go back to the inverse, or sorry, we're on the inverse, when we go back to the original, what does it mean to throw away the bottom or the more negative y values? That's the same as throwing away the more negative x values. So in order to keep the top half of this red graph, I need to keep the right half of the blue graph. And what is the domain of the blue graph on the right-hand side? That is x member of r such that the x values, I chose a pretty easy vertex, it's everything at 0 and to the right of 0. And so now that I have restricted the domain of f, now I can say that f inverse of x is equal to the square root of x plus 6 divided by 3. So only by making this restriction can I state that the inverse is a function. Or, let's just take a look, and this is our last example, or what happens if I want to keep y equals negative the square root of x plus 6 over 3. Well, to keep the bottom half of the red graph, to keep the bottom half of the red graph means to keep the left half of the blue graph. So the domain of the original function, x member of r, such that to keep the left half, that means we're going to choose x less than or equal to 0. And then if I do that, my inverse function becomes negative the square root of x plus 6 over 3. This is the algebra we've done here is trivial. We haven't done anything that was complicated. But the concepts involved might take a little bit of time to get your head wrapped around that. So give yourself that time and revisit this, and please forgive my pretty terrible handwriting here. Okay, from the current textbook, there are some assigned questions to help you practice this a bit. Um, not, questions in the textbook don't always cover points the way I would exactly like them to, so it's also important for you to come back and revisit the examples that I did uh, in the lesson.